Heard this story before. Okay. A lot of you. So, Book of Daniel has three really amazing stories that are very famous. One is this, when they are saved from the furnace. Number two is the writing of the, the handwriting on the wall. And third is being saved from the lion's uh, den. Okay. Last week. Last week, we discussed the first chapter of Daniel, where Daniel and his friends are taken to Babylonia, right? Everybody remembers that. Now, we're at chapter 3, but let me just go over chapter 2 with you, so you have a full understanding of where we are now. Chapter 2, King Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. Do you remember what dream he had? Apparently, he didn't. King Nebuchadnezzar demanded somebody interpret his dream. But before interpretation, tell them what his dreams were. He said, tell me what my dream is and tell me what it means. And everybody came to him and said, King, you're being unreasonable. If you tell us the dream, we'll interpret it for you. But there's nobody alive who could tell you what you dream. You have to tell us what you dream so we can tell you. But King Nebuchadnezzar was unyielding. He was unbending. He says, all of you are going to die. I'm going to kill every one of you. All of you are fakes. You guys think you're so wise. You guys are magicians. And you guys are supposed to be having a supernatural thing. But you guys are all lying. Because nobody could tell me what my dream was. So they were all about to die. When Daniel and finds out about this, he gets his friends... And they said, you know what, we're going to be killed. So what do they do? What, what do you think they have to do? First thing they did was they prayed. They prayed. They prayed to God and they sought mercy. They said, God have mercy on us. We're about to die. Please don't let us die. Okay, so then God reveals the dream and provides the interpretation for Daniel. Famous story. Everybody knows this. Now, Daniel goes and tells the king what his dream was. You know what, king? I'll tell you what your dream was. And it's not me. It's my God. None of this is from me. I don't have any revelation. I don't have any powers. It's my God who gave this to me. He revealed this to me. And he told King Nebuchadnezzar his dream about the big figure with the gold, silver, bronze, and all of that. Now, when Daniel finishes interpretation at the end of chapter 2, this is what King Nebuchadnezzar does. I want you to listen carefully. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face and paid homage to Daniel and commanded an offering and incense be offered up to him. The king answered and said to Daniel, Truly, your God is God of gods and Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you have been able to reveal this mystery. Then the king, that, uh, king gave Daniel high honors and many great gifts and made him ruler of the whole province of Babylon. Ruler of what? The whole province of Babylon. And chief Prefect over all the wise men of Babylon. So he's number one, right under the king. Daniel made a request of the king, and he appointed his three friends to become like a ruler of provinces in Babylon. So, they were brought from Israel to Babylon. King had this dream. He either forgot and then, he demanded people to 
tell him what his dream is and interpret. Daniel does something supernatural because God enables him. He tells him what his dream was. And he says, this is your dream. And what does King Nebuchadnezzar say? He says, your God is God of gods and Lord of kings. Your God is it. He says, Daniel, you rule over everything. You rule, you rule over all the provinces. You rule over all, all the smart guys, all these PhDs, all this brains of our nation. You rule everybody. And Daniel said, you know, by the way, it wasn't just me. I prayed with three of my friends. So the king said, okay, you, you three, you're going to be governor or ruling over governors. And now we read today's chapter 3. Chapter 3 starts with King Nebuchadnezzar making a 90 feet image of gold. That's pretty high. And what does he decree? Decree, king's decree. 한국말로는 어명이야. 어명이요. And, and what's the decree? That everyone, when they hear instruments play, what do you have to do? You have to get down on your knees and you have to bow and worship this image. Now, King gave this decree and some of the officials of the land come and say, you know what? There's some people who are not obeying you. They're the Jews. They pay no attention to you. They just disregard you. They don't respect you, that's what they're saying, as king. They neither serve your God, nor worship the image of gold you set up. Now, king becomes angry. Very, very angry. And he summons the three. And what does he say? First he goes, is it true? And you know what? He kind of gives them a second chance. He goes, you know what? Now, when you hear this instruments, fall down and just worship the image and everything will be okay. I don't care about what you did before. I'm in front of you. I'm looking at you eye to eye. And I'm telling you, you do it here in my presence, it's going to be okay. But if you do not, if you do not, I'm going to throw you immediately into a blazing furnace. And then he says this, then what God will be able to rescue from whose hand? My hand. What basically he's saying is, I have power to kill you. There's no God that's going to save you. So right now I'm giving you a second chance. Because you know what? I'm a nice guy. And I remember you with Daniel, part one, that you interpret the dreams for me and I already put you in high places. But your head is getting too big. You're not respecting me. I told you to do something. You have to do it. I am the king. If you don't do it, I have the power to kill you immediately. So, these three guys answer the king, and this is one of the climaxes of the Bible. I mean, this is just, this faith. You know what they say is this. King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. Who's going to save you from my hand? Our God's going to save you. And this is the climax. But even if he does not, we heard this message so many times, but even if he does not, God's going to save us. You throw us in there, God's going to save us. But even if he does not, what do, what do they say? We want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods. Now this 
has been this message has been proclaimed so many times. The faith of these three guys, right? Even if we die, we're not going to serve you. We believe our God can save us if He wants to save us, but it's His prerogative. Even if He doesn't save us, we're not going to get mad at our God. We're not going to get disappointed in our God. We're just going to die. If that's His choice, Great. I'm happy to go meet him. That's the faith of these three guys. And there's been countless message about this. They could have pretended, okay, I'll worship you. In their heart, I'm not really worshiping you. I'm just doing this to save my life. After one month is over, I'm going to worship my God. When I get home, I'm going to worship. They could have done that. But they didn't do it. You know, their language is kind of, to me, too much. You know, when they say this, King, we don't have to defend ourselves against you with this matter. You can do whatever you want. It's almost like they're challenging God. I mean, challenging the king. It's almost like they're forcing the king to kill them. It's like, I dare you, almost. You know, I wouldn't have talked like that in front of a king. You know, I would have groveled a little bit, you know. I mean, I would have kept my faith, but I would have, you know, trying to kind of, oh, have pity on me, on that pusake. That's what I would have done. But these guys weren't like that. And many people, many preachers, preach about their uncompromising, heroic faith. But today, my sermon is not on that. Today, I want to discuss with you something that every time I read this kind of bothered me. Anybody bothered by this? Anybody have any questions when you read this thing? Anybody? Am I the only one? When I read this, I kept on having this question in my head. Where is Daniel? Where is Daniel? This is the book of Daniel. Daniel is the main character. He's the star of the show, right? I know. We're just sitting there, <laughs> Nathan. <laughs> Where is Daniel? He's right there. <coughs> when I read this story, I was like, <coughs> Where's Daniel? He's the number one ruler right before the king. Why wasn't he involved in here? You know, these guys, when they said, you know, you, you know what, Jews, they don't care about you. Who should have been number one on their list? Daniel. Daniel. Because he was the guy, he was it. But there's no mention of Daniel anywhere. I read this thing over and over and over again. There is no mention of Daniel. And I thought, Maybe, you know, these guys who were going after these three guys, maybe they were smart. They said, you know what? <clears throat> Daniel is too big of a target. You know what? King really loves him. If we go with Daniel, we probably going to get killed. So what are we going to do? We're going to go after Daniel's hands and feet. We're going to go after the support group that's around Daniel. Let's get rid of these guys first. So Daniel becomes what? By himself. Let's get rid of all his friends. So instead of coming after you, I'm going to go after all of your friends, all of your family, all of your support group. Leave you alone so we can take you on. Because you've become an easy target without that. Maybe... Because King, when he heard this, said, okay, send Daniel somewhere else. I don't want him to get involved here. Because once he gets involved, it's, it's too complicated for me. I have to either save all four or I have to kill all four. And I don't want to kill Daniel. Maybe that's what happened. Nobody knows what happened, right? Because the Bible doesn't tell us what happened. 
But one thing I can tell you is it didn't make sense to me that Daniel was not in the story because he was the main character. If you were Shadrach, if you were Meshach or Abednego, what would you have thought? Why are we doing this? What are you doing to us? How about Daniel? Get Daniel. What are you coming after us for? What, is he a too big of a target for you? What, you could get rid of us because we're like co-stars? Thus, the co-star complex. The co-star complex. What are we? We're not the main stars, so you think you just come after us? You think we're just some side extras? You think if you tell us without Daniel, you separate us from Daniel, if you separate us from our leader, we, we're going to just crumple and be afraid and just get in our knees and just worship your God? Is that what you think? These three guys, without Daniel, they were even more courageous. He's like, I dare you to kill us. Because like, God will protect us. And if he does not, we're going to die. We're going to die by our faith. You know, when I was reading this, I thought about back to when I was in high school, and the things that I thought was, I think I had this co-star complex too. And I want to talk to you about this co-star complex. Sometimes, we feel like a co-star in our own life. Have you ever felt that? Just have you ever felt like, you know what? It's my life, but I always feel like I'm second to something. <clears throat> I, I never feel like I'm, I'm a star. I'm, I never feel like I'm the main character. Sometimes in church, we feel like a co-star. We don't think we have enough faith to be the main character, but we're just a supporting cast. Oh, there's all this praise team, and there's all this guy. Well, let me just kind of sit here in the corner, because I'm not really a main star here. I'm just a co-star of this church. Sometimes in school, you think you guys are co-star because you're not, you're not the smartest kid in the in the school? You're not the most popular guy in school? You're not the strongest? You're not... Sometimes you feel like an extra at your school. You know what I mean? And you kind of push yourself down. Sometimes it even happens in our home. Sometimes we feel like a co-star in our own home. Second to our siblings. Oh, my oppa, or, or, or my hyung, or my dongsen, my brother or sister, they're the main stars. My parents love them. I'm just a co-star. Nobody really loves me. I just kind of have to like adjust to everybody else's characters. Maybe you guys feel like you're secondary co-star to your parents' careers. Or their church activity. Oh, church is number one in their life. I'm just a co-star in my family. And you always feel this, oh, I'm not worthy. I'm really nobody. Sometimes in life, we feel that bad things happen to me, or I'm the only one asked to do all the sacrificing. How come, God? How come it's me always getting into trouble? How about that guy? What, is he the main star? I'm just the co-star? I'm just an extra? Don't I matter? Sometimes we feel like this in our life, that God has made me co-star in my own life. When I begin to regard myself as some insignificant character, an incidental person, an expendable existence, I feel depressed. I feel devalued. I feel lonely. I feel meaningless sometimes. Well, I want to tell you
this entirety of humanity, this whole world. We call it history. Whose story is it? It's his story. It's God's story. And in God's story, there are no stars. There are no cool stars. Everybody is equal. There are no main characters and side characters. It's God's story. God is the star. And everybody is equal in God's eyes. All of us have this thing called the intrinsic value. The value not because we are smart, not because we do this stuff, not because we're recognized, not because we're popular, not because we're good at sports, not because we're good at music. Not because of what we do, but who we are. Value from just being you. You are God's star. Your life is valuable to God as anybody else's life. You know, if you don't believe me, believe the action of Jesus Christ. He considered us so valuable, he, used, he chose to die for each and every one of you. God himself died for you. How dare you consider yourself a co-star and devalue God. Understand? When you don't think of yourself as worthy, when you don't think of yourself as valuable, you are degrading not only yourself, but God. Because you are made in His image, and He even died for you. Galatians 3, 26-28. Let's everybody read this together. You could read this sitting down. Galatians chapter 3 verses 26 through 28 says this. So in Christ Jesus you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jews nor Gentile, that neither slaves nor free, nor is there male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Amen? I want you to turn to somebody next to you and say, you are made in the image of God. <laughs> I want you to all get up and find somebody new. I want you to all get up. And from some find somebody you didn't say this to and tell them, you are infinitely valuable. Infinitely valuable. You want to kiss it? You know what you're trying to do? How much value? James, how much value? Infinite. Yeah. That's your value, right? Yes. You already knew that, right? I'm priceless. All right, you press this. I want you to find somebody else and say, You are aboundingly loved. You, you are aboundingly loved. loved. Okay, now it's getting harder and harder. I want you to find somebody else and say, God loves you so much that He died for you. God loves me so much. God loves me so much. Oh, yeah. That's I want you to tell yourself. I am the star in God's story. I am a star in God's story. I am a star in God's story. You are infinitely <coughs> valuable. Yes. Superstar G for God, right? You know, these three guys, they could have complained. When King said, you guys are the stickers, said, but King, where's Daniel? Oh, right. Get Daniel in here. You know, we prayed three times. That guy prays five times. <laughs> that guy's even worse than us. He has even more faith than us. Bring him over here. 
They didn't do that. They stood in the faith that they had in their God. Amen? I want all of you to know you guys are infinitely valuable. And you are not a second best person. You are not second class citizens. That in God, I want to make sure every one of you do not consider your, yourself as just an extra. I want you to really know, you know, I'm special to God. And I don't want anyone in here to be depressed, to feel lonely, to feel like you're not worthy. Because all of you are. Okay, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you, God. I pray that we will not have...